Okay, welcome everyone to We Are Triathletes webinar series. And this actually is the grand finale of this year's um, webinars. And it gives me great pleasure to have Matt Dixon of Purple Patch Fitness as our keynote end of year speaker. And he just came out with a new book the book is called Fast Track Triathletes, and I'm going to show it. And his first book was amazing. I loved it, The Well-Built Triathlete. And this book is just as good. I've been reading it. I'm like, you know, halfway through it. And, um, and I've got a ton of questions to ask Matt Dixon. So without further ado, I will have introduce you to Matt. Um, Matt, tell us what you've been up to since the New York Tri Expo um, in March of 2016. So March of 2016, that, that was a fantastic experience. I was, uh, I, I, I loved coming out. I loved meeting so many people. And, uh, and since then, I think it's been a, a roller coaster, one might say. We've had a, a, a very busy year with, um, with our professional squad the last year and a half. We've also had a, uh, an incredibly busy time with our squad here in San Francisco. We have a broad range of athletes from people that are just getting into the sport, I would say aspirational, haven't even completed an Ironman or a triathlon yet, let alone an Ironman, um, all the way up to people that are obviously just getting ready for things like the Hawaii Ironman that we just came back from. So uh, it's been an, an incredibly busy time, but also really fruitful. And of course, in the midst of it all, I've been writing a book what you are just holding up. So I want to ask you all about the book because I've got lots and lots of questions. First off, can you talk a little bit about your pillars of success? I know you mentioned that in your first book and you mentioned it again in this book. So if you could just, you know, elaborate on that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, it's, it's, we sort of call it the purple patch pillars of performance and, and it's really the grounding that the, the, the most basic, but uh, and I mean basic in a positive sense, most basic grounding of every Purple Patch program. It doesn't matter whether you're an elite athlete or aspirational, just getting into the sport. And it's really a mindset of what training is, what, what preparation for performance in the sport, as well as ultimately performance in life is. And I think that a smart training program is not just swim, bike and run. I think that's the easy part, the obvious part, because that's the sport that we're getting ready for, triathlon, your endurance training. But as a parallel to that, on a level playing field, we also highlight the importance and the contribution of good habits, such as nutrition being the second, uh, recovery being the third pillar, and strength and conditioning to be a great human being, to a great performing human being, as well as, uh, of course, the the knock-on effect of athletic performance and injury prevention. So those four pillars are the grounding of every Purple Patch program. And I want athletes as an educational tool to buy into those main pillars, as we call them. So the last webinar that we did, we um, talked about nutrition and natural nutrition. Can you talk to us a little bit about why it's so important for triathletes to focus on nutrition? Yeah, and, and I think first we, we have to break down uh, what we're talking about with nutrition. So I, I, I sort of see three main areas. The first is, as I call it, nutrition, which is your breakfast, lunch, dinners, and snacks in between. There's also your fueling, and those are the calories that you consume either during training or competition as well as immediately following. I still think about that as fueling. So I really se separate the two and say there's nutrition, which is your platform of healthy eating. And then there's your fueling, which are the calories that you consume during and immediately following to facilitate performance during the session and recovery from that session. And the two are very different, but, but, but also equally important. And then the third factor is hydration. And everyone gets lured into straight away thinking about hydration during the training session because we know it's important not to get overly dehydrated during training. But I also think about 
water and hydration as being sort of the energy for life and critical for the stuff that we do outside of our training to make sure we maintain energy balance, to make sure that we have alertness, make sure that we facilitate cellular health and recovery from the training that we're doing. And so the three of them are really important. For a training athlete, the first thing that facilitates success is getting your fueling correct. That's <coughs> that's really important and most importantly the number one habit for all levels of athletes is ensuring that after every single training session they consume calories following the workout during the workout you only need calories if you're going to be training or exercising more than an hour underneath that you don't need any calories for the most part over an hour every i mean it, but regardless of that over an hour you need to consume calories but regardless of that post-workout consumption of calories is really important and real food is great it's in a typical basis real food is really important if we do that correctly we not only facilitate recovery we also reduce unnecessary stress and we hold off what i call athletic starvation so many of the signals that people get the urges for pizza pasta chocolate ice cream by replenishing the calories early and giving them a sense of control for the rest of their life. Then in the, the rest of your daily eating, which is your regular meals and your snacks, you can really focus on the foundation of healthy eating, just being a normal, healthy human being. So that's lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, lots of proteins, lots of oils, not too many sugars, not too many starchy carbohydrates is what all of the latest research shows. So that's the overall approach in a, in a nutshell of how we approach it. Now, in the book, you talk also about how um, triathletes like to party. We like to party. We, we play hard. We work hard. <laughs> we race hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, why is partying bad for a long course triathlon? everything in moderation including excess and so uh the, the, i think that the the last thing that that i would want to do for a, an amateur triathlete who's trying to integrate this sport into life is to try and turn them into a monk and so um so i'm i'm not advocating uh not advocating never drinking alcohol never having a glass of wine never having a beer never eating pizza all of that is fine it all fits into the scope of a normal healthy life but if you are pursuing a goal and you want to do well and you're getting ready for a half Ironman or an Ironman distance race, uh, it is unapologetically, it's a demanding sport. And we're trying to integrate this into a really big life. You've got commitments with work, you've got commitments with family and relationships often. And we have to balance all of this within life. The key component of success, as we talked about first, it's not just about swimming, biking and running. We also need to recover well. And the three most important recovery tool that you have is not taking a day of exercise, it's sleep. And if you consistently and regularly highly compromise sleep with too much alcohol, being the number one sort of tool of partying, as you, uh, as you might say, then it is going to, without doubt, compromise the adaptations and performance yield that you get from the hard work that you're putting in so everything in moderation including excess occasionally is great but when you really are in your race field you want to try and limit the very late nights and look many of my amateur athletes they have a glass of wine with dinner no worries when it starts to move to two to three glasses of wine many nights of the week it will compromise your sleep and ultimately it will impair your performance in the sport but also your performance in life which in my mind is is really important as well how you're performing in your work in your health and what you can bring to your family and friends mm -hmm. and you know in your book i think you're trying really to to talk about how to balance it all i mean and that that to me is is really the hardest thing because Sometimes we just get so wrapped up in the sport and we forget, you know, I'm, there are people in our lives that we need to focus on. So talk to us a little bit about how you can create that balance when you do a long course triathlon. It, 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 you know, it's, 
you know, I talked about it being demanding. It's quite funny. Last night I was down in um, San Diego and I was giving a presentation to the San Diego Triathlon Club. We had a hundred people there or so. And, uh, and I said, one of the first things that I asked to them, I said, how many hours a week do you think that you have to train to get ready for a half Ironman or Ironman? And people said, as they always do, they said, 20 hours a week. I said, okay, interesting. How many here honestly, truly has 20 hours a week to train? And no one put up their hand. I said, does that make us all failures? I said, no, but the perception of success is that you have to commit this huge body of training, which is impossible for normal people to integrate. And so what ends up happening in the sport is there is a perception on the number of hours that are necessary. People chase those hours and end up in a cycle of failure. They either arrive at their races feeling unprepared because they focus on all of the sessions they missed because they just couldn't get them in, or they fight to cram them in, they compromise sleep, and they've gone through a cycle of injury, sickness, fatigue, and ultimately underperformance. And so the way to achieve success, it's we still want performance. Everyone that I know that participates in this sport wants to improve. Of course, you want to improve. You, 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 you love the sport. It's healthy. It's a, a passionate sport. It is a demanding sport, but we still want to improve. That's part of the journey. And so the question is how? And I know that it isn't cramming and forcing training in, compromising everything in life and ending up with a cycle of injury, fatigue and sickness. And so instead, we approach it from the completely the other side. And we actually say not how many hours do you have to fit into life and instead take a really honest assessment for every athlete to say, how many hours do I have? What are the non-negotiable things that I have in life, work, family, travel, whatever I might have? How many hours a week do I have to actually give to training? And then the question is, how do I maximize those hours? And when, when you approach it from that lens, it is simple but from a personal standpoint, revolutionary for the athlete, because suddenly they're, they're, they're approaching it with, this is what I have, how am I gonna maximize what I'm gonna do here? And that creates sustainability. And if you can sustainably train over many weeks and many months, you improve every time. Because even if, if you think about it, if you do 20, 20 weeks of training and you train 10 hours a week, rather than that mythical 20 hours a week, you've still accumulated 200 hours a week, 200 hours of training. That's a lot of training. And that's a lot of training to get ready for a single day. So, so that's the general approach that we have. It's obviously deeper than that, but it's, it starts with a real shift in perception and a shift of mindset of what training success is. So is there... Uh, an actual time that we should allocate as triathletes to do a, a half course or a long course distance? I mean, should we say, you know what, we're going, I'm going to do, you know, Lake Placid next year and I'm going to do the full course. How many hours should I allocate, you know, knowing this? I mean, or, or is it just dependent on the person? It, 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 it's, it's generally dependent on the person. And, you know, I, I coach professional athletes and I don't train them 10 to 12 hours a week because what we do is we suppress their life and wrap life around their training so they can do 20, 25, sometimes 30 hours a week. For a regular amateur that has a very busy life, life is not a spreadsheet. It is not static. It is crazy, dynamic, etc. So we want to have an approach where generally uh, if someone has all the time in the world and they're a trust fund uh, athlete and they don't have any responsibilities, then sure, they can train more. And it's all about what their body can handle. But for most of us, it's really about fitting it into the ebbs and flow of life. And so typically in the general range, I'll say that the average number of hours that our amateurs train with busy lives is somewhere between 10 to 12 hours a week for an Ironman. That's about norm. If they have the week off work or they get to have an extra couple of days where they can go away and go and train on the course then that might ebb a little bit and they can expand training on that week but if training if life goes <coughs> away, we still want them to retain specificity and so it might be on a different week that they only get eight hours a week in 
And it really becomes about that decision. And that's what I talk about in the week of not just having success being checking every workout, but having a hierarchy of workouts of importance so that the athlete can be empowered to make smart decisions as they go along. Now, you also talk about race strategy in the book. Can you tell us a little bit about how to strategize for a race? Yeah, some of it, some of it depends on the level of the athlete, the level of the experience. Uh, but in general, especially in long course triathlon, half Ironman and Ironman distance, um, I think it's really important to, uh, I think, one of the another one of the great mistakes is to be overly ambitious on race day of what you can actually do and in fact a truly aspirational race execution is putting together your best swimming training session that you've done your best biking training session you've done your best running session and linking them together and saying that's race day so there's nothing it's everything that you've already done in training all together that's really the mindset so in order to do that globally, we know that during every session, the big mistake is that people go out too hard. And so we always think about from an emotional standpoint, the accumulation of work, the accumulation of fatigue will come. So we want athletes to be very controlled on the front end of each discipline and try and have their best swimming, their best biking and their best running occur to the middle to the back end of each event. And then layered under that is being pragmatic in mindset to try and create what we call form under fatigue. So not about going harder on the back end, but be able to retain swimming well, riding well with thought and purpose around terrain, how you're sitting on your bike, and then particularly running well in the middle to back end of each of the disciplines. That, that's a sort of the, the quick two minutes on it. So it's kind of like a negative split on each of the different disciplines. Yeah, I think that's for, for the that's the safest way to approach, the smartest way to approach to set yourself up for success for the back end of the race. That's awesome. Um, you have a bunch of different exercises too. I mean, this is a great book. It's it's you know this is this is one of these books that you definitely should have on hand. Um, do they differ or are they similar to the other exercises that you had in the well-built triathlon uh, triathlete or are these completely different exercises that you, that you have? Yeah, they're, they're actually completely different uh, deliberately. The, the, um, so the, the strength and conditioning, the book in itself has, has basically three training programs. It has a 14-week training program to get ready for an Ironman, 14 weeks to get ready for a half Ironman, and both of those are dynamic, bizarre, even though they're written in a book. And what I mean by that is that they're very flexible training programs that can be scaled to time, scaled to fatigue. So if you're running out of time, this is how to scale every single workout. If you're tired on a day, what you do. And then in support of that, there's also a strength and conditioning program that you were just showing. And that strength and conditioning, I felt like for the time-starved athlete, the person that is doesn't have all the time in the world, that doesn't maybe have access to a... Uh, a gym, uh, either because they might have a gym membership, but going to the gym takes 20 minutes to get there, an hour for a workout. Who has that time? So we designed a, uh, an abbreviated program so far as time, but retaining the specificity. And so this is designed to be done in short period of time, 20 to 30 minutes. You can do it for the most part in a hotel room, in your kitchen, or in the gym. Uh, it has some equipment, but mostly no equipment that you certainly um, need to purchase. And, uh, and it makes it, it's a very time sensitive, critical supporting element. So it's fresh exercises, fresh mindset, and really built to be very time efficient. So with someone who's working full time, I guess, you know, I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit, but you know, just, just a wrap up of this. Somebody who's working full time, they make it on the Long Island Railroad to get to work every day. You know, so they've got to leave at like six o'clock in the morning and they get home at nine o'clock at night. Just, you know, is it really feasible for somebody like that to be able to do an Ironman? It is. I, I actually, I coach several people 
that, that do just that, uh, hop on and get busy. It's, um, so I, I think that the answer is it depends. And, uh, and the reason it depends is that uh, what are the outside uh, components as well? Do you have the buy-in with your family, for example? And how can you strategically integrate it? If you are truly leaving at 6 a.m. and getting home at 9 p.m., with absolutely no opportunity to train in, in between that time at all, I think it's very challenging. And what I would say to that athlete is, if you truly are a you know, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. depart, 9 p.m. return, embrace the sport, do swim, bike and run, but it's probably not the time necessarily to do an Ironman and do it effectively. But that success in this sport, and success of healthily integrating this sport into your life, the multi sport lifestyle, doesn't mean you have to do an Ironman. But if you do have an hour in the morning or an hour in the evening, most days of the week, and you get on the weekend the opportunity to do two or three hours on one day and maybe 60 to 90 minutes on the other, you absolutely can. But it's going to require some out of the box thinking. Uh, as we talked about, thinking about it from the other side of the equation and creating a program that's sustainable in your life. And the one thing that we would avoid is, I'm going to do that for eight weeks and get ready for an Ironman. If that's true to your lifestyle, we want to create a sustainable program over many weeks, more like 20, 24, if not longer, and say, let's really get ready over many weeks. And then you can go and have a, a wonderful experience. I have one question um, from Noah. I'm going to unmute you, Noah, and you can ask it. Oh. Hi. So, uh, Matt, so how, I'm assuming some of your athletes do get injured. So how, what do you normally, how do you work around their, that injury or, you know, what, what do you do typically? Yeah, it's funny. We were talking about it last night at the, uh, the triathlon club speech that I did. And, uh, and I said, look, this sport is demanding and it includes running, which is a, uh, a load bearing sport. And so the cycle of injury with a smart approach should be greatly reduced, but you, it would be mythical. It'd be snake oil for me to say, follow my advice. You'll never get injured because you know, we're, we're human beings that move around. And so what do you do in this sport? when you do get injured. This sport is unique in that there's very rarely an injury that you can do nothing. So in other words, and the sport, I think people make the mistake of isolating it and saying this sport is swimming, cycling, and running. This sport is swim by plane. And so the most common place for a person to get injured is via the run. And if, if you get injured in the run, I just see that as an opportunity and in fact, experience shows us as well that that's the time that maybe you can't run but you lean into the other two disciplines and the beautiful thing about swimming and biking is it has a wonderful cross-pollination effect into running and so swimming for cardiovascular conditioning you're being supported in water 90 percent of your weight is displaced you can get tremendously fit in swimming in biking wonderful muscular resilience and cardiovascular conditioning and quite often when you actually take one out because of injury, we don't want to get injured, but you can focus on the other two. Those two improve without the influence of running. And when you reintegrate sensibly running back into the equation, it doesn't take very long, 30 to 45 days before you're running right back at the level again that you ever were and sometimes improved. And so while we don't want athletes to get injured, we never want athletes to get injured. Almost every time there is opportunity and it's finding opportunity. Is this a time I'm going to focus on strength and conditioning? Is this a time that I'm going to focus on the other two disciplines and not judging yourself? There have been athletes that have won the Hawaii Ironman World Championship not running for six weeks before the race because of an injury. They've lent into swimming and biking. If that can occur at the elite level, it can certainly occur at the amateur level. I may has a question and I'm going to unmute her. Um, good morning, Matt. Good morning. So this is actually a question that I've heard multiple times in the Women for Try forum on Facebook. They're usually coming from older female athletes who are being, I, I don't know if I'd say bullied or teased about being age group athletes that are finishing their Ironmans after 15 hours. 
And so do you have any advice for age group athletes who are, who are a little bit older and they take longer to finish an Ironman distance race so they don't get discouraged from continuing on because they love it? Yeah, I mean, I think anyone, uh, I think anyone that's um, uh, bullying anyone for their time in, a, in the finish line of, uh, of an Ironman needs to be hung by their feet from the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, this sport is not about, uh, you know, is not about how fast you are. It's, it's about so much more than that. It's the successful integration of this, ultimately a really healthy sport. Yeah. Three disciplines. Some, uh, for, when you think about it, women specific running is really good because it's weight bearing. So we think about bone density, strength and conditioning is really important for women. Once they pa pass about 30, uh, about 50% of bone density as they go through um, menopause drops in the first two years post-menopause. So strength and conditioning is really, really important. And then you have swimming, a total body, all exercise and cycling, which has adventure and some wonderful elements to it as well. So this is a wonderfully healthy sport, emotionally, physically, practically, and I think really bit feeds into the needs of female athlete. And so all of that is just to say, it's horrifying that anyone would ever judge. Uh, find some new friends if they feel like that. I, I, I view the sport for any athlete as being a, a very personal journey. The common thread between a professional athlete to someone that's looking to get across the finish line for the first time is that pursuit of improvement. And, um, and so what I would do as a, as a female athlete is, is really sort of take a look in the mirror and say, why am I doing this? And, and you said, I'm enjoying it. I'm thriving. And it takes me longer. Anyone, it's the same thing in life. Anyone that is saying anything negative about that, you have to make, I think, a decision. Anyone has to make a decision to filter out and ignore that side of stuff and lean into the positive side of the sport. And, and I'll give you a, a great example. The reason I was in San Diego was for the Challenged Athletes Foundation. So they had the best day in try. They had 200 athletes that were amputees, uh, ranging from uh, cancer patients that had lost, lost limbs, kids that have been hit by trains, people that were born with birth defects. Uh, you talk about a visual person of being different. And for this weekend, every single one of those kids and adults was an athlete. And, and, uh, and it's very grounding to see it's not about sport. It's about human potential. And I would argue that you, if it is you that's spending 15 or 16 hours to do an Ironman, you're sort of still on the pursuit through athletic means of finding your best human potential. And anyone that tries to drag you down on that, what can I say? The word screw them. doesn't matter. That's just, that's just water off a duck's back. And you know what? They're only saying that because of either jealousy or their own insecurity. And so that just filters out and that's just let it wash away because I would lean into the people that you trust, you love and, and reasons why you're doing it, which is to find your best human potential. I love that, Matt. That is fantastic. Really. You, 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 you just nailed it. I really think that was awesome. Um, Matt, tell people, um, you know, our teammates and et cetera, how they can get in touch with you um, and Purple Patch Fitness. Sure. The, um, so the website is purplepatchfitness.com. You can, uh, if you would like me to, to uh, ink up the book and send you a signed copy, you can purchase the book through there. And the best way to get involved, you don't have to become a Purple Patch coached athlete to get involved with us. Uh, obviously, the, the book itself, but at the back of the book, there's actually an offering for, for people that purchase the book. I, I believe so much in education, and there was stuff that I didn't get to put in here. So at the back, we gave an offering for, uh, for people that have purchased the book for three months of our, uh, of our free education program. So this is typically people who have a bunch of videos, podcasts, supporting education, interviews, a weekly bulletin from me that's only education focused. And it's uh, typically 25 bucks a month. As a fast track athlete reader, you can, um, you can get that for three months as a part of the book. So that's probably the best way to get involved even if you're coached by someone else, even if you have your own training program, you can use the training programs in here, of course, but we love community and we love education. So, um, so people can get involved that way for sure. Purplepatchfitness.com. 
That's awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate your time today. And uh, this is Hillary Topper signing out for We Are Triathletes.